Okay, we'll see if that works or not. All right. Miles Davis, huge, important figure in jazz fusion. Of course, fusion means to put two things together. Right? Oh, I didn't quite get the introduction. <laughs> I didn't get it. Take a picture. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> so fusion means to put two things together. So in this case, we're fusing jazz and rock. Um, we've talked about swing music. We've talked about big band music previously, but now we're into the 60s and 70s. So um, swing and big band are old are oldies at this point. Um, do, people like Duke Ellington and Benny Goodman are most, mo many of them have already passed away. So jazz is seeking a new way to kind of break into the mainstream and keep itself healthy and viable in 1940s jazz musicians began playing in small after hours clubs in new york and instead of playing to please large audiences they were experimenting and playing for their own enjoyment and and their own um experimentation unlike big bands the combos were small often just a piano bass and one or two wind instruments Alto saxophonist Charlie Parker and trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie battled, battled with other musicians on who played the fastest, most complicated, and most creative solos. This style of jazz became known as bebop. Bebop is a style of jazz that emerged in the 1940s, and it's characterized by fast, complicated solos performed by small, by small combos. Musicians who played in this style were constantly striving to innovate and push musical boundaries. The style of cool jazz emerged in response to the blistering tempos and rapid fire solos of bebop. Cool jazz was slower and more laid back, and it, it projected a sense of intimacy and closeness that had been absent in bebop. The album that ushered in the era of cool jazz was Birth of the Cool, recorded by Miles Davis in 1957. It was a nonette, that means nine, of both black and white musicians. Davis removed the tenor saxophone in, in favor of the French horn, which is kind of unusual in jazz, and he also eliminated the guitar. Both of these changes lent the, on, the ensemble a cooler and more subdued timbre. During the 1950s, Davis focused increasingly on the avant-garde styles and expressions, culminating in an album, Kind of Blue, in 1959. On Kind of Blue, Davis experimented with free forms and unusual harmonies. Davis was always looking for new model, modes of expressions, harmonic languages, interesting rhythms, and innovative instrumentation. His 1970 album, Bitches Brew, represents yet another phase in Davis's career, a jazz and rock fusion. Davis admired the lengthy instrumental solos that he heard rock performers like Eric Clapton and Jimi Hendrix deliver. Further, Davis became interested in playing for audiences that were comparable size to rock shows. He wanted to reach out and expand his, um, his musical outreach. Jazz had never drawn the types of crowds who came to listen to Hendrix. <clears throat> they still honestly don't. As a result, Davis began experimenting with integrating elements of rock into jazz. For his first recorded foray into fusion, Davis was joined by John McLaughlin on guitar, Wayne Shorter on saxophone, and, and Joe uh, Zawinell, Chick Corea, and Herbie Hancock on keyboards. As we will see, all of these musicians went on to create their own jazz fusions labor, ensembles later in the 70s. The other musicians who played on Bitches Brew were Black, White, Latino, American, British, and Austrian. Davis had pl had played with an integrated group of musicians since the 40s and seemed more concerned with achieving the right kind of sound than recruiting musicians who were only African American. The diversity of the performers on this album also suggests the wide reach of both jazz and rock in the 1960s. The instrumentation of Bitches Brew clearly reflects the influence of rock. The acoustic piano is, a, is replaced by an electric keyboard and organs. In fact, three different keyboardists performed on the album. We just heard their names. The acoustic upright string bass was replaced by electric bass guitar. 
Davis in introduced the electric guitar into his instrumentation. Davis also preferred the soprano saxophone to alto, tenor, or baritone saxophone. The most prominent solo instruments heard on the album are Davis on trumpet and Wayne Shorter on soprano saxophone. The influences of rock in Bitches Brew went beyond just the instrumentation, though. The drummers almost always played with straight rhythms instead of swing. A swung rhythm is a standard part of jazz, by in, and in, by incorporating straight rhythms, the music sounds markedly different from most jazz. The difference between swing and straight is a straight rhythm goes one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. But a swung rhythm goes one to two to three to four to one to two to three to four to. It's got a swing, it sways, it feels like it's got a, a kind of a limp. And that's a swung rhythm. That, that's been a standard part of jazz ever since there's been jazz. The album also included a number of post-production recording techniques like overdubbing, reverb, tape delays, and looping. Remember, all those kind of things were things that the Beatles were doing, um, that the Beach Boys were doing um, to enhance their studio album experience. You couldn't really do it yet live but you could do it in the studio. And that's why the Beatles weren't touring anymore because they were concentrating on all those elements in the studio. These had become standard practice in rock music by the late sixties, but they were practically unheard of among jazz mu musician recordings. The electric instruments frequently employed distortion and feedback, sounds that were also borrowed from rock. Musicians played long, expansive solos that more closely resembled the guitar solos of Eric Clapton or Jimi Hendrix than they resembled traditional jazz solos. Davis and other musicians explored unusual and asymmetrical rhythms like 5-4 and 7-4 and 7-8 and 5-5-8. Five, five, Most of the music on Bitches Brew was written by Miles Davis with a few exceptions. Zo Joe Zawinall wrote Pharaoh's Dance and Wayne Shorter wrote Sanctuary. Pharaoh's Dance is the first track on Bitches Brew, and at 20 minutes long, it takes up the entire first side of the album. <laughs> Don't mind that, that's my cat freaking out. <laughs> Pharaoh's Dance is notable for several reasons. The frequent stops and starts in the opening of the track were created by tape loops. Davis and his producer created the sounds by repeating loops of several different sections. The recording includes trumpet, soprano saxophone, and bass clarinet, plus two electric pianos, electric guitar, string bass, electric bass, two drum sets, and an additional percussion on congas and shakers. Okay, here's the question. Can we open up Spotify to hear? Can I do this? No, that won't work. Can I do this? That will work. Okay. Kind of experimenting with how this all works with just one screen. Whoa, that was exciting. Okay. Okay, since Pharaoh's Dance is 20 minutes long, we are not going to hear it in its entirety. But I do want you to hear those opening loops. Come on. Why can you actually hear it more than usual? <laughs> like, yeah. usually we can hardly hear it. <laughs> the, uh, one in the classroom. So you can kind of hear that fusion of all those different instrumental sounds that they didn't seem to really be matching up that's because they're not live they're looped
Okay, that seems like a good stopping spot right there. So we'll we'll cut it off right there. Again, as always, if you want to go back and hear the rest of that, it's available to you. Um, and you can go back and listen to the rest if you would like. Because it is pretty cool. Okay, this is in my way now. Where can I put you guys that <laughs> I can get to stuff? Okay, here we go. Bitches Brew angered a number of critics and fans, many of whom felt that Davis had violated a number of rules of jazz as a genre. That should sound familiar because remember, people got really bent out of shape with Bob Dylan when he decided to go electric and they said he was selling out. They said the same thing about Miles Davis. Much of the criticism surrounding Bitches Brew considered one, concerned one of two issues, either that Davis had sold out and become too commercial or that Davis was no longer playing African-American music. In one review, critic Stanley Crouch wrote, Davis was firmly on the path of the sellout. Davis's music became progressive, progressively trendy and dismal. <laughs> Although prog rock musicians were exploring the integration of jazz and classical idioms into rock music, for a jazz musician to play in a rock style was practically unthinkable for many jazz purists. Other critics took issue with the rock language of Bitches Brew because they perceived the album as Davis turning his back on African American music and musicians. Although rock and roll was originally an African American genre of music by 1970, rock was dominated by white musicians, with a few rare exceptions such as Jimi Hendrix. Most listeners, black or white, considered rock a white genre of music. In contrast, jazz, which was created by African Americans around the turn of the 20th century, was regarded as an African American genre of music. Certainly jazz had its great and respected white performers, but by and large, jazz was still considered an African American genre of music at that time. To some critics, when Miles Davis began play, playing the African -American, genre, African American genre of jazz in the style of white rock music, he was betraying jazz's roots and origins. Despite the anger it incited in some listeners, Bitches Brew was Davis's most successful album, selling over 500,000 copies. Although it may have upset some jazz purists, the album drew in a number of listeners for whom Bitches Brew was their first exposure to jazz. According to an advertisement, critics agree Miles Davis has found a new audience, or is it that rock has just found Miles Davis? It also inspired a number of other jazz musicians to begin exploring rock instrumentation, forms, and meters in their music. As we will see, a number of musicians who performed on Bitches Brew went on to record some of the best-known fusion albums of the 1970s. No, whoa. <laughs> Let's try that again. There you go. The most popular and influential of the post Bitches Brew fusion ensembles was Weather Report. Here they are, right here, Weather Report. Formed by Austrian keyboardist Joe Zawinel, who just played on Bitches Brew, and African American saxophonist Wayne Shorter, who also played on Bitches Brew. They added Mir Miroslav Vital. I'm not sure how to say that. Vitaus, a classically trained Czech bass player, Alphonse Muzon, an African American drummer, and Erto Mori Moreri, Moreira, Morella, it's Brazilian, <laughs> percussionist who also had played on Bitches Brew. The group's early recordings were filled with avant garde experimentation, such as free forms and continually unfolding solo lines. For example, Milky Way from 1971's Weather Report was created by Shorter playing his muted saxophone into the strings of the piano, creating an ethereal atmospheric recording. Zawinul was constantly exploring new methods of sound production and, and creation, including ring modulators, unusual percussion instruments, tape delay effects, the ocarina, um, which is an enclosed vessel flute with finger holes. Often they're made of clay. Sometimes they're, they're carved out of, um, sometimes they're glass. Hmm. Um, it's a, it's um, a folk instrument. You know, I've always wanted to have an ocarina, but I've never actually seen a good one. <laughs> They're usually well, plastic. I have one that's shaped like the TARDIS. So <laughs> oh, that's cool. The African American thumb piano, which is also called a kalimba, the melodica, which is an instrument that's half harmonica and half keyboard, and the polyphonic synthesizer. 
The group frequently invited guest musicians to perform with them, both live and in their recordings. So let's take a moment and let's hear some of Milky Way while we're in the neighborhood. Again, it's 20 minutes long, so we're not going to hear the whole thing. Oh, I take it back. It's only two minutes and 31 seconds. My bad. It hadn't switched over. That honk you heard was a soprano saxophone. That was Wayne Shorter. Hold on there. So as you can hear, that's, uh, that's quite a departure from what we've been doing before. In 1976, Johnson was replaced by Jaco Pastorius, a fretless ba bass player who had a melodic playing style. Weather Report's first album with Pastorius was in 1977's Heavy Weather, which was also their best-selling album. The standout single from Heavy Weather was Birdland, which was composed by Zawinul. Birdland features singing bass lines from Pastorius that sound more like melodies than bass lines. The track also prominently features a, synth a synthesizer that creates the sound of a brass ensemble. The name of the track comes from a prominent New York jazz club, and the club received its name because jazz legend Charlie Parker, whose nickname was Bird, frequently played there. Despite the track's strong influences from rock, such as the electric bass line, the synthesizers, and the straight rhythms, it's clearly indebted to jazz, both in its name and the instrumental performance style from musicians such as Shorter. Weather Report continued to tour and record until 1986, but the membership was constantly shifting. When the band dissolved in 1986, Zawinul and Shorter were the only two remaining original members. Zawinul con continued to play until his death from cancer in 2007, and Shorter still performs live and records. So let's take a moment and hear Birdland. Thank you. 
hate to stop right there because I really dig that tune. But in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead. Oh, too far. Another important post Bitches Brew Fusion Group was the Mahavishnu Orchestra. John McLaughlin was a British guitarist who performed on Bitches Brew and he began the Mahavishnu Orchestra in 1971. Here he is right here. McLaughlin recruited pianist Jan Hammer, drummer Bill, Billy Cobham, and bassist Rick Laird, and violinist Jerry Goodman for his new ensemble. The membership of the group was diverse. We had Panamanian, Czech, and Irish. Like a number of rock musicians and members of the counterculture in the 1960s, McLaughlin was interested in Eastern religion and philosophy. He studied with an Indian guru and his guru encouraged him to name his group Mahavishnu, which means divine compassion, power, and justice. McLaughlin had a very specific ideas about how the group should sound and which instruments it should include. Goodman's presence on violin was a particularly critical aspect of the sound of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. McLaughlin's own guitar also provided another integral component of the group's sound, a double neck guitar that had six strings and 12 strings. This instrument allowed McLaughlin to play in many different styles. According to musician Chick Corea, what John McLaughlin did with his electric guitar set the world on its, on its ear. No one had ever heard an electric guitar played like that before. Additionally, keyboardist Hammer played the mini Moog synthesizer, which allowed him to create a wide range of sounds. The album Birds of Fire in 1973 is typically considered the Mahavishnu's best work. Chick Corea, who we have mentioned several times, here he is right here. He's at the piano. This is Bobby McFerrin behind him, who's also a well-known jazz musician and, and um, composer, singer, and orchestra conductor. Hello? Andrew, you okay? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Chick Corea, who'd played keyboard on, keyboards on Bitches of Brew, started his own band in 1972 and called it Return to Forever. With bassist Stanley Clark, guitarist Al Demiola, drummer Lenny White, and pianist Chick Corea, they delivered a variety of jazz rock offerings. The group's early music was heavily influenced by Latin music, which can be heard in the popular hit Spain from the 1972 Light as a Feather album. By 1973, almost none of the original personnel remained, and the group's style changed accordingly. Return to Forever was now playing music that was clearly influenced by rock. But it's clear melodies with its clear melodies and driving harmonies. Korea did not begin using synthesizers until 1974's Where Have I Known You Before. Up until that point, he had played electric keyboards exclusively. This album also prominently featured rock guitar distortion, another characteristic borrowed from rock music. Song to the Pharaoh Kings prominently ex features Korea at synthesizer and keyboard soloist, and it also includes themes borrowed from Eastern philosophy and melodic ideas borrowed from Indian music. In addition, each member of the band plays a solo. So let's take a moment and hear Spain. That's one album back from where we're currently talking about, but that's okay.
hear the violin there? fusion flute became very common in jazz ensembles. Truly appropriate. Try to find a good stuffing spot. There's really not one. Okay, there are lyrics to this that I didn't pull up. You don't hear them because <laughs> nobody sings. I'm just going to stop because there is no good spot to stop. Again, if you'd like to hear the rest of that, it's available to you. You're welcome to go back and, and take a listen to it. Herbie Hancock was another Bitches Brew alumnus who went on to have a successful career. His album Headhunters came out in 1973 and sold well, eventually going to number 13 on the album charts. He followed Headhunters with Thrust in 1974, and then he composed the soundtrack album for the film Death Wish in 1975. All three of Hancock's albums from this period were in the jazz rock fusion style. Despite the role that rock music played in influencing Hancock's style, none of these albums included a guitar. Instead, Hancock preferred to, preferred to play many of the parts himself on different keyboards. He used a Fender Rhodes electric piano, an ARP Odyssey synthesizer, a clavinet, to name a few. Chameleon is a track from Headhunters that features Hancock playing a, fee, a repeated 12 note bass line on the ARP Odyssey synthesizer. Throughout his career, Hancock has collaborated with many different musicians and explored a variety of sounds in his music. For example, his 1983 song Rocket featured hip hop recording scratching and introduced listeners to sounds of emerging genre of hip hop. In addition to Death Wish, Hancock also wrote original scores for the films Blow Up in 1966 and The Spook Who Sat by the Door in 1973. Let's hear Rocket. This was a big hit on the, um, on the radio in, in its day. Um, and as it was said, it was kind of an introduction to uh, the, the emerging genre of hip hop. Thank you. 
So that scratch, we're so used to that because we hear it all the time. But at the time, that was a brand new sound. This was during the MTV era. Um, so it was, uh, of course, it had an accompanying music video. And it was a big hit on MTV. I'm going to stop right there in the interest of time. That brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> I'm a child of the 80s. I remember that very, very vividly. So in conclusion, although a number of rock musicians were experimenting with sounds and styles of jazz during the late 60s, it was Miles Davis's Bitches Brew that was the first major release by a jazz musician who was experimenting with the sounds and styles of rock music. The album helped Davis reach new audiences, and at the same time, it upset jazz purists who accused Davis of selling out. Many of the musicians who played on Bitches Brew went on to create their own jazz fusion groups during the 70s. Weather Report... The Mana, the Mana Vishnu Orchestra returned to forever and Herbie Hancock had varying degrees of success. Each group innovatively approached the, jazz, the fusion of jazz and rock styles. And that is tonight's code word. If you are watching this recording, the word is fusion, fusion. So be sure and send that to me. Okay, this will be open after class tonight. I did not have a chance to do any, any opening of anything. I barely got everything set up and online. Okay. Let's go on to hard rock. Hard rock. In this lesson, we will consider the genre of hard rock, which emerged in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. The genre of hard rock grew out of the psychedelic rock tradition, as well as the British blues revival movement. Like psychedelic rock, it focused on loud, distorted electric guitars. Like the blues, it was riff-based. The hardness of hard rock came from an emphasis on the bass guitar as well as on the bass drum. Most of the early hard rock groups began their careers by playing either psychedelic rock or blues, or sometimes both genres. The pioneering hard rock group Led Zeppelin began as a last-minute replacement for the Yardbirds and grew into one of the most successful rock bands of the 1970s. Still a very familiar name today. Most performers for hard rock during the 70s did not use that term to refer to their music. Hard rock has been applied in retrospect. As a result, it is not always easy, uh, not always to define, let me try that again. As a result, it is not always to define a clear line between hard rock and heavy metal, as we'll see in this lesson and the following lesson on heavy metal. While both genres are heavy and riff based, hard rock has clearer roots in the blues and psychedelia, where heavy metal tends to tr tends to deal with darker subjects and have fewer numbers of sung lyrics. Like a number of major rock genres that developed in the late 60s and early 70s, hard rock emerged from the United Kingdom. An offshoot of the British blues revival tradition. Remember, Eric Clapton was one of the, the leaders of that whole thing. Hard rock included weighty bass drums, a strong backbeat, and heavy guitar distortion. One of the most defining features of hard rock is its emphasis on riff-based structures. In earlier rock music, riffs might have been featured in the introduction of of a song or during a bridge section. In hard rock, riffs became the primary structure around which an entire song would be built. Riffs are heard throughout a hard rock song, except when they drop out in order to focus the attention on an instrumental solo or section of music. British power trio Cream is considered one of the forerunners of hard rock. Sunshine of Your Love, for example, includes a prominent bass riff throughout the song. 
In addition, drummer Ginger Baker played two bass drums instead of just one. The bass riff and doubled bass drums created a, a bottom heavy sound that would become a characteristic of hard rock music. Remember Eric Clapton was one of the, the, uh, the guitarists in Cream. So let's hear a little Sunshine of Your Love. This is one of the most familiar riffs in the history of rock music. When I teach um, guitar at the middle school, this is one they all want to learn. They, they want to learn this riff. They, or they will play it. They don't know where it comes from. <laughs> so I have to tell them, yeah, that's Sunshine of Your Love. Bet you've heard that before. It's getting near dawn when lights close the tire light. I'll soon be with you, my love. Give you my dawn surprise. Up right there i bet you've heard that before that's a a pretty familiar uh rotation on classic rock stations if you listen to classic rock stations i bet you've heard that before iron butterfly was another important predecessor of hard rock iron butterfly was a psychedelic band that had formed in san francisco during the 1960s like jim morrison and the doors iron butterfly focused on the darker side of psychedelia and most of their music is heavy and dense their best known song, Inagata De Vida, recorded in 1968, is 17 minutes long and held together by the weighty opening riff. True to the psychedelic movement, Inagata De Vida contains lengthy improvised solos on organ, guitar, bass, and drums. So let's hear a little Inagata De Vida. We're not going to hear the whole thing because <laughs> it's 17 minutes long. But again, I bet you've heard at least this opening riff before. doing his very best Jim Morrison there. Bye. 
What's interesting about that riff is that it's not played on the bass guitar. It's played on the lead guitar. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet you've heard that at some point before because that is a pretty familiar and standard guitar riff. The American band Vanilla Fudge was another psychedelic rock predecessor of the hard, genre of hard rock. Vanilla Fudge took Brill Building, Motown, or other pop tunes and transformed them into lengthy psychedelic covers. You Keep Me Hanging On was a Motown song written by Holland Dozier Holland and recorded by the Supremes, but in the hands of Vanilla Fudge, it became a dark, weighty tale with a wide range of volumes and incorporation of the sitar. So let's hear a little bit of their cover of You Keep Me Hanging On. No lyrics. We'll stop right there. It's a good stopping spot. Doesn't sound like Diana Ross and the Supremes, that's for sure. Okay, now I can't see my arrow anymore. There it is. The British group Deep Purple was one of the earliest hard rock bands. The earliest incarnation of the group Coding keyboardist John Lord, guitarist Richie Blackmore, drummer Ian Pace, singer Rod Evans, and bassist Nick Simper had a single hit, a cover of an American pop tune called Hush. The group had little success until 1970 when Evans and Simper were replaced by singer Ian Gillen and bassist Roger Glover. This version of the group released three hit albums in a row, Deep Purple in Rock in 1970, 
Fireball in 1971, and Machine Head in 1971. That is some pretty fast work. Machine Head includes the singles Smoke on the Water and Highway Star, both of which uh, were major hits. Smoke on the Water has the riff-based structure that was a hallmark of hard rock style. Um, if, unless you have been living under a rock for most of your lifetime, you have definitely heard Smoke on the Water because it's one of the most familiar guitar riffs ever created by human beings. Another favorite of middle school guitarists. Because you can play it all on one string. So that riff's going to continue until a solo comes in. stop right there. I bet you've heard that before. An early American hard rock band was Steppenwolf. Um, interestingly enough, they put Deep Purple's picture here instead of Steppenwolf because <laughs> this is Deep Purple. Um, they changed their name from Sparrow to the title of a novel by Herman Hesse. Steppenwolf's music was a riff was riff based, although they did not always play the riff throughout the entire song as later hard rock bands would. Their high volume and heavy distortion were important parts of the hard rock genre that had been carried over from psychedelic rock. The band's hardness was indelibly linked with the 1969 film Easy Rider, which included the songs Born to be Wild and The Pusher in its soundtrack. The Pusher was a cover of a Hoyt Axton uh, tune that dealt with addressed drug dealing in its lyrics. Born to be Wild appeared in the opening credits of Easy Rider, and it's the first song to use the term heavy metal in its lyrics. However, the heavy metal in Born to be Wild is that of a motorcycle, not of rock music. A heavy riff opens the song and continues underneath the lyrics, except the middle section of the song when singer John Kay performs the song's title line. The song has come to be associated with motorcycles and the culture surrounding them. If you're not familiar with the, the movie Born to be Wild, it starred um, Dennis Hopper and Jack Nicholson, and it was about motorcycle culture. Peter Fonda, thank you. My husband just walked in and said Peter Fonda. Um, let's hear. Ketchup and pickle. Hello? We had like 50 tenders in the span of 10 minutes, and I said, fuck it, I'm not making any more tenders. I don't um, Gabrielle, I like you a lot. Can I help you? So I made so many tenders. It's okay. So and I put those in the fire to make it a little bit crispier. Okay. I'm glad they're going to be crispy. That's a good thing. Okay. Let's hear "Born to Be Wild" again. I am willing to bet you have heard this before. Come 
Okay, I'm going to stop there because I'm sure you've heard that. That's really fun to play on ukulele, by the way. Which all brings us to Led Zeppelin. The band that has come to symbolize hard rock was the British group Led Zeppelin. Here's Jimmy Page and his double neck guitar right there. When the Yardbirds disbanded in 1968, Highly respected session guitarist Jimmy Page recruited bassist John Paul Jones, drummer John Bonham, and vocalist Robert Plant to fulfill the Yardbirds' few remaining concert dates. They finished out a Scandinavian tour as the new Yardbirds, and then they changed their name. Two stories exist about how Page chose the name. The first is that he borrowed a phrase Keith Moon often used to describe a bad concert, going down like a Led Zeppelin. A Zeppelin is an airship, in case you're not familiar with that term. The second term, the second idea is that he was inspired by both the name and music of Iron Butterfly and chose a name that also combined light and heavy elements. All of the members had participated in the British blues revival scene, and Page wanted to combine electric blues, acoustic, acoustic folk music, and experimental or psychedelic techniques. Page wrote most of the group's music, and Plant often wrote the lyrics of the songs. Led Zeppelin's first album, self-titled in 1969, included acoustic and electric instrumentation, traditional and experimental techniques, and folk, psychedelic, and blues characteristics. Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You is an acoustic cover of a folk song that was written and first recorded by African folk, I'm, I'm sorry, American folk singer Anne Breeden. In the guitar solo during Good, Time, Good Times, Bad Times, Page passed his guitar through a rotating Leslie speaker in order to create a sonic swirling effect. This song also features Bonham's pra practically superhuman ability to play the bass drum of the a drum set at a rapid fire speed. Further, Bonham played only a single bass drum, whereas other rock drummers needed two bass drums in order to play as quickly as Bonham did. So let's take a moment. Let's hear. Let's hear. Good times, bad times. Oops, I went too far. Working with one screen is uh, not easy. Bass drum. No matter how I try, I find my way to the same old jam. Good times, bad times, you know I like my jam. When my woman left home, I'm not a man, I still don't seem to care. Sister, I've got a girl as sweet as could be. 
You hear that guitar riff repeating itself over and over. The lyrics go on, but the guitar riff remains the same. Lots of distortion, very heavy backbeat. Dazed and Confused in 1969 was a cover of a song by Jake Holmes, an American folk rock musician. The song includes a descending, a descending bass riff that repeats throughout the entire song, except, of course, during instrumental breaks. The lengthy passage of instrumental improvisation during Dazed and Confused shows the influence of psychedelic rock in its, in its attempt to create a distorted sense of time and reality. Dazed and Confused also shows Page's devotion to experimental instrumental techniques. During one passage, he plays his guitar with a violin bow. So let's hear, let's hear some Dazed and Confused. There it goes. To me, this, this sounds a lot like Janis Joplin and Big Brother and the Holding Company. that very heavy bass riff. Okay, and the bass the bass riff continues behind the lyrics. So that's pretty long. We'll stop right there with that. Okay. 
The group's second album, Led Zeppelin II, was released in 1969. The recording sessions for the album were scattershot and took place all over the world, including London, LA, Memphis, New York, and Vancouver. Despite the fact that the band would record in different studios at different times, the album send, the, ended up sounding consistent and cohesive. The production quality of Led Zeppelin II was equally attributed to Page and to sound engineer Eddie Kramer. According to Kramer, we did that album piecemeal. We cut some of the tracks in some of the most bizarre studios you can imagine, cheap studios. But in the end, it sounded bloody marvelous. There was a unification of sound because there was one guy in charge, and that was Mr. Page. Page praised Kramer's skills with equal enthusiasm. Led Zeppelin II is generally considered by fans and critics to be the band's heaviest sounding album. It was also the first album on which Page played his Gibson Les Paul guitar, the instrument with which he became associated. They continued to include a variety of sounds, themes, and styles in their music. Ramble On prominently features the acoustic guitar, which is a nod to folk music tradition. But at the same time, it engages in fantasy fantasy themes inspired by the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien, in case you don't know that name, Ooh. The Lord of the Rings. You know, I've never actually sat down and uh, read all the Lord of the Rings books, but I really should. You really <laughs> I should. love J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, yeah, you really should. Yeah. <laughs> um, fantasies or abstractions were common, were common in psychedelic rock, and the Tolkien inspiration was the result of Plant's personal interest in the author's work. Page and Kramer took advantage of a number of recording and post-production techniques in what is and what should never be. For example, they panned the sound of the guitar back and forth between channels, and the sound of Plant's voice was phased through a stereo field. Let's hear a little bit of what is and what should never be. Got to go down to go up. If I say to you tomorrow, take my hand, child, come with to meet me. It's to a castle I will take you. Well, what's to be, they say, will be me. I guess the wind says, been sailed away, leave the day away. there before we get into too many solos you can really hear their, their blues based influence in these songs eh. page before the preferred the album format and resisted the idea of releasing tracks as singles thus the only single release from led zeppelin 2 was whole lot of love the song quickly became a fan fa favorite and is a staple of the band's live shows. Whole Lot of Love is riff based. The guitar plays a two bar riff in the opening and then the bass joins the guitar for the subsequent statements of the riff. 
The only time the riff stops completely is during an instrumental interlude in the middle of the song. The song is verse chorus with an extensive psychedelic interlude between the second chorus and the third verse. The song also ends with a lengthy, lengthy vocal improvisation from Plant. During the psychedelic interlude, the sounds of the guitar and voice are panned from side to side in the stereo field, and a number of avant-garde studio effects are audible. The interlude also includes the sounds of a theremin, an electronic instrument that we encountered in the context of the Beach Boys' good vibrations. Whole Lot of Love also features production technique called reverse echo, which Page can, claims to have invented. In reverse echo, a recorded echo is played backwards, and the reverse echo is placed before the sound it is supposed to be echoing. That makes me dizzy <laughs> to think about. Let's hear a whole lot of love. I bet you've heard this one. I bet you've heard that before, so we're going to stop there. Plant's lyrics for Whole Lotta Love were based on You Need Love, a Chicago blues song by Willie Dixon that had also been recorded by Muddy Waters. Plant was a devoted fan of the American blues, and he frequently quoted or alluded to blues lyrics in his own songwriting and during the band's live performances. According to Page, Plant, uh, Plant Page's riff was there before anything else. I just thought, well, what am I going to sing? That was it. Uh, it was a nick, which means theft. Dixon sued Led Zeppelin, and with the money he earned in his settlement, he started an organization called the Blues Heaven Foundation. The goal of the Blues Heaven Foundation was to help blues musicians recoup royalties from other artists' recordings of their songs. Because remember, for a long time, people were stealing right and left from these guys without any kind of recourse. So uh, it's a good, it, the formation of the Blues Heaven Foundation is a good thing. Um, if you get a chance, if you haven't been, you should go to St. Louis and go downtown and go to the Blues Museum and spend some time there it's it's a great education they have a lot of live performances there too it's it's really worth your time i if especially if you have an interest in rock music it's um it's worth going huh i didn't even know that existed and oh, yeah st louis yeah. never seen it <laughs> yeah it's, it's relatively new it's been there maybe seven years or so oh hmm. groups third Might check that out with... sometime next yeah, time you, you really should <laughs> The group's third album was entitled Led Zeppelin III, coming out in 1970, and it contained many more acoustic tracks than had appeared on either of the two earlier albums. Many of the songs were influenced by folk music and Celtic music, but they remained characteristic, they, but they remained characteristic of the band's heavier numbers. For example, Immigrant Song is still electric and riff-based, but the riffs are shorter and more rhythmic when compared to the melodic riffs heard on the band's first two albums. If you are a Marvel fan, you should have heard Immigrant Song, at least the beginning of it.
I'm going to stop there. I bet you've heard that before. It was featured prominently in Thor Ragnarok, in case you don't know the Marvel connection there. In 1971, Led Zeppelin released their fourth album. They did not give it a title, but it's usually called Led Zeppelin IV, in keeping with the formula of, of adding numbers, or Zoso, which was a symbol that Page included on the design of the album. All the songs on the album were written by the members of the band, except When the Levee Breaks, which is the cover of a song by rural blues musician Memphis Minnie. This album also contains Stairway to Heaven, which is not only Led Zeppelin's most popular song, but also one of the most popular rock songs ever written. The acoustic, opening acoustic guitar melody of Stairway to Heaven is reminiscent of music from the Renaissance period. The guitar is soon joined by recorders, the recorder is an inblown wooden instrument that was popular during the Renaissance period as well. Um, you may have played them in school. They were probably made of plastic when you played them, but usually, but the true recorder is made of wood. Plant's voice joins this instrumental texture for the first two minutes of the song. Then electric guitar, electric piano, and bass supplement the acoustic instruments. The drums do not join until four, over four minutes into the song. Eventually, Stairway to Heaven segues into a hard rock final section, complete with a screaming blues-influenced electric guitar solo performed by Page and the definitive wailing vocal style of Plant. The eight-minute song concludes with Plant's unaccompanied articulation of the song's title, She's Buying a Stairway to Heaven. Although it was never released as a single, Stairway to Heaven is regarded by critics and fans alike as one of the greatest rock songs ever written. You'll hear it as a single now because, again, it's a pretty standard fare on, um, on classic rock channels. When Led Zeppelin was uh, given the Kennedy Center honor a year or so ago, the band Heart covered this at their um, induction ceremony, and it was really, it was really quite, quite great. I don't know if I can get to it or not is the problem. There we go. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead so that you can hear when it expands and becomes more rocky. Okay, so now we have some electric instruments going on. And the drums are in.
So the tempo is picked up. And it's gotten a lot heavier. And it kind of winds down like a music box. One of the most familiar rock songs in the history of rock and roll. Led Zeppelin toured and performed extensively during the 70s. And they were one of those popular live rock acts of the decade. And they sold more tickets than any other group, including the Rolling Stones. A 1976 concert in Pontiac, Michigan drew over 75,000 fans. Most of their live performances also featured acoustic sets during which they would sit down to perform. They also sat closer to the audience during acoustic sets than they stood to the audience that than they stood to the audience during their electric sets. Although Led Zeppelin's music often featured extraordinary feats of post-production and experimentation, the live acoustic sets offered them a chance to play music for their fans that had not been altered or manipulated in any way. And that would eventually turn into something called Unplugged on MTV, where artists would sit down and do exactly that. They would play acoustic instruments instead of playing electric with a lot of overdub and all that and all those other gimmicks. The group's next album, Houses of the Holy, in 1973, contains synthesizers and a Mellotron. The album also contains no covers or adaptations. All of the music was written by the members of Led Zeppelin. In 1975, Led Zeppelin released the double album Physical Graffiti, and the popularity of this album led to a resurgence in popularity of all the band's previous albums. Soon after Physical Graffiti was released, the five earlier albums all returned to the Billboard Top 200 album charts. This remarkable feat occurred again in 1978 when Led Zeppelin released their seventh album, In Through the Outdoor. In 1980, Bonham died of complications due to alcohol abuse. The three remaining le members of Led Zeppelin elected to dissolve the band rather than attempt to replace Bonham with another drummer. So during the 70s, Led Zeppelin did not identify itself as a hard rock band. Remember, that was something that we came to call this music after the fact. That label was applied to the group and its music retroactively. In retrospect, however, their riff-based music, steeped in the American blues tradition and accented with weighty drumming and heavy bass, is a clear representation of the aesthetics of the genre of hard rock. Some critics have also described Led Zeppelin as the first heavy metal band, but members of the band have publicly disagreed with that label. The band also codified a a formal structure that would become the norm for rock bands from the 70s to the present day. Like Whole Lot of Love, many rock songs featured a verse chorus structure with a lengthy instrumental section separating a verse and a chorus in the middle of the song. This form is also called AABA structure, wherein each A contains a verse and a chorus, and the B contains the instrumental interlude. So if you look at AABA, it's verse, verse, big solo, verse. Although another music, although other music in this course, such as Broadway songs, have also had AABA forms, the AABA form used for Led Zeppelin and other rock musicians was not directly influenced by Broadway composers. Led Zeppelin also considered one of the primary influences of the development of stadium rock, that is, music suited to be played and performed in large outdoor ar arenas and venues. Stadium rock also refers to, con to a concert series or tour. Throughout the 70s, Led Zeppelin consistently sold out enormous venues and successfully played to crowds of thousands. And it's, it's when this music's so loud, playing it outdoors is really 
<laughs> frankly safer for your ears and for their ears than playing it inside in a venue where you're going to get a lot more feedback and echo. Further, many critics and fans argue that Led Zeppelin set the standard for album-oriented rock, or AOR. AOR refers to music that was conceived to be heard in the context of an entire album. Now, we've heard that before, right? We've talked about concept albums during pro when we were talking about prog rock, um, things like Tarkus. Um, that, that's not a, a brand new idea, but they said th they're saying that Led Zeppelin kind of perfected that idea. Led Zeppelin's lack of interest in releasing singles and their ability to sell millions of albums without releasing any singles established them as prominent figures in the shift away from singles-oriented rock to album-oriented rock. Hard rock grew from the psychedelic rock and blues traditions into a heavy riff-based rock genre. Early groups such as Deep Purple, Iron Butterfly, and Steppenwolf recorded some early examples of hard rock, but in general, Led Zeppelin is regarded as the quintessential example of a hard rock group from the 70s. Not only did their music come to represent the genre, but they also played a crucial role in the development of arena rock and the importance of album-oriented rock. Further, they, they established a formal structure to their music that many rock bands will follow and continue to follow to the present day. So it is eight o'clock. I think we're going to stop there, even though we only got through two chapters tonight. So the quizzes for, for chapter 24 and 25 are going to be open here shortly. I would encourage you to do them soon. Um, several of you have reached out about the midterm, and I will take a look at that while I'm opening these other quizzes and see what I can do about that. So um, you might want to check back on that um, this evening as well. Um, if there are no questions, we will call that good for tonight and we'll and next week is Halloween, but we are going to go ahead and have class. I'll record it. So if you have things to do with with kids, you know, if you're if, if you need to trick, take care of trick or treating stuff, you will be able to watch the recorded zoom later on. Oh, and also, um, will I be able to possibly um, make up those one quizzes that I didn't finish? I, I have quite a few of them done, but I could get through them quickly because um, really, I was just let's a bit concentrate lost. right on, right now on making sure everybody gets the midterm taken care of. All and right, maybe toward a little bit to, more toward the end of the the semester, we could go back and reopen those. Okay, thank you very much. It's just, <laughs> I'm not used to getting so far behind on my stuff. <laughs> I just, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> but thank you. You bet. Have a good night. You too. Okay, Max, Gabrielle, do you have any questions? Or is it okay for me to go ahead and in the Zoom? Okay, hearing no objections, I'm going to go ahead and end the Zoom. If you do have a question, please email it to me.